Good morning, Meadowbrook Church. It is very good to see you. It is very good to be with you. Like the video said, my name is Craig. Uh, I've been, I'm on staff here. I've been on staff for seven years now. And um, we're so glad you're here. Whether you're online or whether you're in person, it's good to see you and it's good to be with you. So my family and I are completely decorated for Christmas. We're done. Um, I'm pretty hardcore. I start on December 1st and not a day earlier. Sorry to offend anyone. Um, but we're done. Inside, outside, the halls have been decked, the trees up, everything special and fabulous. It's great. One of our most prized Christmas possessions is a gift um, from my aunt uh, for our wedding. And it's this gorgeous, beautiful, handcrafted, hand-painted nativity set. Like, really heavy, expensive material. Um, and it's in a box in our basement because we have kids Kids come with little hands. Little hands sometimes break things, right? And that's okay. Um, and so we don't have our nativity set up. We will one day. This is a picture of one of the nativities, actually from our, my coworker, Chris, I have on the screen. This is a new set that they got that he wanted to share with me this week as I was talking about my message and sharing a few things I'm going to focus on. Um, and I think that really captures the beauty of Christmas, right, is that beautiful picture of the nativity. But what's missing from that picture? You've got wise men. You've got a couple of shepherds, of course, baby Jesus and Mary. Where's Joseph, right? Um, Joseph's missing. And did, did you notice? Did you miss him? Because he's easily forgotten. Joseph is usually missed, and he's often not remembered. And that is what I love about his story. This is exactly what makes his story impactful, that makes his story powerful, and what makes it meaningful, especially for me as I'm navigating the, the, the passage this week, and I'm looking at this guy who is a husband and who's a father who's not on the forefront by any means. That's what makes it powerful and that's what makes it special because we see Joseph of Nazareth. We see his humble life and we see him make Christ known and step into the background and kind of become, become seemingly unknown. So that's what we're learning from Joseph this morning is that when we make Christ known, we make Christ known by becoming unknown. We make Christ known by becoming unknown. And so the passage of Scripture, if you're not there already, Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, we're going to look at three big things that Joseph teaches us. He teaches us what it means to be righteous, he teaches us what it means to be selfless, and he teaches us what it means to be obedient. Righteous, selfless, and obedient. So before we jump into the text, let's pray together. God, thank you for this Sunday. We thank you that as we step into another week of Advent and another week of of December that we get our hearts and our minds right about what this season is about. And it's not about us, and it's not about all the things that we think make it special. It's about your son. So God, I pray that we can be able to see through all those things and to see the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, God bless you. <laughs> we pray this in your son's mighty name. Amen. Love it. All right, let's read the passage together. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Follow along with me, please. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. So I want to help us understand a little bit about what's happening with Joseph, uh, Mary and Joseph's relationship here in this passage. We see it right off the bat in verses 18 and 19. Uh, we talked about how Joseph is righteous and how he teaches us to be righteous. So Jewish marriage in the first century... Um, 
is very different than what we would understand of marriage and engagement uh, today in 2022, quite obviously. Um, by Jewish cu customs, a betrothal, right, an engagement, is a lot different than what we understand engagement to be, uh, an engagement to be today and how we'd understand that. Hebrew marriage has two stages, betrothal and then the marriage ceremony itself. So betrothal and the ceremony are what makes, uh, makes up a Hebrew marriage. The marriage and relationship itself was almost always organized and orchestrated by the families. So the bride and groom had really little to no say and little to no interaction. They kind of had no idea what was going on. So a contract was made and was sealed by a, with a payment. So this would be the dowry or the bride price, right? So there's a contract with a payment, and usually this is paid by the groom or by the groom's father uh, to the bride's father. So this contract, this payment, if you will, was to help with these wedding expenses um, and served as this type of insurance for the bride in case the husband, if the groom were to divorce her. And so this contract that was happening was considered binding as soon as it was made. Right? Even before the wedding ceremony, this contract was considered binding. The man and the woman were considered legally married, even though the marriage ceremony and consummation did not occur maybe sometimes until a year later. So this betrothal period, this engagement period, serves as a time of, of, of probation and almost as a fidelity test, if you will. And the bride and groom during that time had very little contact. So that's what's happening here right away in this passage. And we see that Joseph finds out, we're not quite sure if he hears it straight from Mary or from somebody else, he finds out that she's pregnant, right? And we look, take a look at verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. Her husband was faithful to the law. So what does that mean? What is he talking about? And if we look at the, that word faithful to the law, some Bible translations might say just, right? It means that he is just, that he is righteous, that he is merciful. And it can also mean that he's not given to passionate vengeance, right? He's not going to do something wrong or evil towards or against Mary. And so there's two things that we can take away from this, or from Joseph being faithful to the law. One is that him being named righteous, him, named, him being considered just, that he had righteous moral standards, that he knew he shouldn't go through this marriage because Mary was pregnant, and he knew he wasn't the father, and naturally he assumed that Mary had been with another man. So he's faithful and righteous to the law. He's a God-fearing, law-abiding Jewish man. So that's the first thing, right, that we see, that he follows the law. And the second thing that we see about his righteousness is that this righteous attribute, part of who he is, it means that he's also righteous in his love, and he is righteous in his kindness. And he couldn't bear the thought of shaming Mary publicly, which is common in this time period. And he had every right to do so. So notice that also that he himself had been shamed, right? The woman that he's supposed to be marrying ends up pregnant. And that could fall back on him and blow up in him in tons of different ways. But we don't see any rage. We don't see any bitterness. We don't see any resentment mentioned from Joseph's part. But his concern is for Mary. His thought and his focus is on Mary and her shame. And instead of publicly divorcing her, his plan is to do it privately, right? In a way that would kind of honor her. And so the big question for us when we see that Joseph is righteous and teaches us righteousness is what does it mean for us to be righteous? Right? What does it mean to be righteous today? And there's a couple of passages of Scripture that I found that basically focus and emphasize this. Um, but basically, to answer that question, what does it mean to be righteous today? It's for us to live in such a way that shows others that we are God's people. For what it means for us to be righteous today is that we're to live in such a way that shows others that we are God's people and that our righteousness might glorify Christ. There's a pastor and preacher by the name of uh, Paul Washer. You might, may or may not have heard of him. And he shared this really beautiful illustration and example of what biblical worship through song and through praise, but what just worship of God should look like. And he gives this example of if you're walking down the street and you see somebody looking up at something. And you wonder, what is so captivating about what they're staring at? And then you start to look up too. And pretty soon everybody else on the street is looking up at that one person and what that one person is looking up at. Right? That's what it means to live in such a way that shows others that we're God's people and that our righteousness might glorify Christ. Right? That's what the worship of our God should look like. Not because people are looking at us, 
but because they see us looking at him, and in turn they do the same thing, right? Because we make Christ known by becoming unknown. So in that example, the people aren't looking at us, right? looking at God, and looking at the things that God has done in our lives, and all we can do is point to him. So the first thing we see about Joseph is that he's righteous, and he teaches us, teaches us that righteousness. The second thing we see is that he is selfless. So follow along with me in verses 20 to 23. We're going to look at how Joseph is selfless. After considered all of these things, and an angel appears to him in a dream, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She'll give birth to a son, and you'll give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Joseph has a plan. I'm going to divorce Mary privately, quietly, right? It's within the confines of the law to do so. I care about Mary enough to not make it a big deal. I care about her to not publicly shame her, so I'm going to do it privately. And as he's thinking about these things, an angel appears to him in a dream and entirely shatters and breaks down what his plan was. He has this realization that it's no longer about his marriage to Mary. It's no longer about what it means for him to be a father. It's no longer going to be about his story, but about God's story. And he he sees that and he captures that. In the beginning of the the story, we just see that Joseph finds out Mary's pregnant. He doesn't know how. But an angel reveals to Joseph, it's much more than you think it is. Mary wasn't with another man. She's conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and she's going to give birth to the Son of God. Imagine you're just this newly about to be married guy and you find out that your wife is, to be wife is pregnant. And then you find out that not only is she pregnant, but she's pregnant with the Son of God. You can understand how Joseph's plan completely falls apart. And it begins to think about, less about himself and more about Jesus and more about God's plan. Because the reality is, being selfish is easy, but being selfless is hard. Being selfish is the easy thing to do, but being selfless is the hard thing to do. So Joseph died to his own self. He died to his own desires. No longer was he going to have an ordinary marriage. No longer was he going to have an ordinary relationship with his firstborn son, or it's going to look like the way he thought it would look like. He's not even going to have an, an ordinary social standing. Can you imagine how outcast you'd become? Imagine Joseph and Mary having to tell people, he's the son of God. Yep, he's the son of God. We were told to name him Jesus because he'll save people from their sins. He's the son of God. Joseph's saying, I'm not the father. We don't know how it happened. From before Jesus was born, Joseph set aside his own expectation. He put God's mission first. So it leads us to the question, what does it mean to be selfless? What does it mean to be selfless today? Philippians 2, 3 and 4, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain deceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In order for us to be selfless, we have to have the mind of, of, of Christ, which is a humble mind. And the way we fight that sin of selfishness is to ask God to renew our minds so that they become, our minds become like Christ's. And in perfect selflessness, Jesus regarded, regarded the greatest need of every human, right? The forgiveness of sin and our reconciliation of the right relationship with God. He did all this that the will of his Father would be more important than his own glory. To the point where he laid down his life for us at the cross. That's what selflessness looks like. Ironically, um, I have a lot of important Josephs in my life, not just what I'm learning from Joseph Joseph of Nazareth. There's a lot of important Joes that I know. Um, One of them is my buddy Joey. It's Christmas morning, 2017. Kelsey and I had our first baby a month prior. So we have a one-month-old baby, and it's Christmas Day, and I'm loading the gifts and presents into my Jeep, and I wanted to warm up my car, and I slammed the door while the car is running. 
It's also Christmas Day, uh, if I didn't mention that. And so I don't have a backup key, right? It's Christmas Day. And so any company that would come in to help me out would charge me an arm and a leg because it's Christmas Day. So I, only, I did the only thing I could do. I called my buddy Joey. He lived a few blocks away. I said, hey, man, I know it's Christmas. I'm really sorry, but my car is running. There's thankfully no baby in the car. Um, that, that would be a new dad move um, for sure. But it was just a presence. The car's warming up. And he's like, I'll be right there. And in three minutes, Joey's at my house. And we're jamming pieces of wood and rubber into the window. And we're trying to get the window down so that we can pop the lock. And he's working on one side of the car, and I'm working on the other side of the car. We both got these you know, coat hangers that we jerry-rigged to try and push the lock button. And of course, Joey's the one who saves the day. So after an hour of trying to get the door unlocked to get my car, my keys out of my car, so that we could go to Christmas and Joey could go to his own family's Christmas, he finally you know, hits the unlock button. And we breathe a sigh of relief, and we were able to go about our separate ways. But that's what selflessness looks like in my life and my, for my buddy Joey. And we're not the only ones to be impacted by this man. Um, because my friend Joe has been an amazing, an amazing example of, of what it looks like to live selflessly and to put others first. Uh, put, uh, put others first. So he and his wife um, take in little kids who need a home all the time. And, you know, after four years of waiting, this year they were finally able to go to Africa to adopt their little baby boar. After four years, um, they met a couple in Africa, and they have been hosting them when they, as, because they've immigrated here shortly after they adopted their little boy. So not only that, but they're caring for another couple, and they're hosting another couple from Africa who has literally no possessions, no contacts, no families, but they just happened to meet Joey, and their lives have changed because of, that, because of this. Over the years, I've, I've watched how Joe selflessly gives his time, his resources, his heart to others, all because of the gospel, because he desires to point people to Jesus. And you never would have known, because he does it all quietly, with humility, without a desire for recognition, making himself unknown so that Christ becomes known. We see Joseph teaching us righteousness. We see Joseph teaching us selflessness. And the last thing he teaches us is obedience. So verse 24 and 25, he has this plan to divorce Mary. The angel appears to him in a dream, and it completely changes that plan and says, I'm going to submit and follow what God is. It's not about me anymore. It's about God's mission. Verse 24, it says, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Right? That's the first, one of the first things that the angel addresses in the dream. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Joseph, in verse 24, wakes up and does exactly what he's been commanded to do. Right? That's what obedience looks like. He woke up and did exactly what the angel commanded. He's immediately obe- obedient in the midst of fear, and he stays faithful. Right? And he names him Jesus. He has no input. He's been told you have to name him this, okay? And he's obedient to that, right? In these verses and in the rest of the gospel of Matthew after this birth narrative, he's never called the father. When it talks about Joseph, it says, and Joseph took the boy and his mother. And Joseph took his mother and the boy. And then they left and fled to Egypt. He's never referred to as the father right here. Joseph is this beautiful picture of what it looks like to be a humble leader and a humble servant, living righteously, living selflessly, living obediently, because it's not about him. Joseph seeks to make Christ known by becoming unknown and stepping into the background. The big question we take away from this is, is what does it mean to be obedient? And Jesus gives us that answer. John 14, Jesus says, whoever has my commands and keeps them, is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So we see that Jesus says his obedience is the proof of love. And love brings us into this incredible intimacy with the Father. 
obedience is a proof of love. And then love is able to bring us into that connection and that deep relationship with the Father. Because submitting to God brings us closer to God. And we see it in Joseph's life. And we see how he, he takes on this task of being a father, to, a, a father to Jesus, the Son of God. I'm going to say something. You, you, can, you can take it or leave it, whatever you see fit. But moms take these beautiful babies and they make them into boys. And dads take those boys and they make them into men. Joseph quietly, faithfully, humbly living a faithful Jewish life raised the Son of God as his own adopted son. And Joseph made Jesus into the adult male that we see in Scripture. Think about that. The carpenter's son, Jesus is called. Not the son of Joseph. The carpenter's son. That's how behind the scenes Joseph is. No recognition, no attention. But Joseph faithfully raised this boy, trained him up into his profession, and led him in adulthood. I think that's the reality and the picture of what parenting can be like. Parenting can sometimes be the most thankless job. Because it's not about us. It's really not. As I navigate this blessing of a task and this blessing of a responsibility with my wife, Kelsey, and we ask, what are we, what are we doing? <laughs> Who let us be parents? What are we teaching them? What is it we want them to grow up in? And no matter how I think about it, I always end up at obedience. Please clean that up. Don't hit your sister. Please have some patience. Wash your hands. Be kind to your brother. Gentle, slow down, you're going to get hurt. Right? A huge focus of parenting in the early years is obedience. And the amazing, it could be even in the teenage years, um, the amazing thing about being a father is that you come to a place where you can identify with God the Father. That never really happened. Marriage taught me, as soon as I got married, it showed me how selfish I was. And I made it all about myself, about my own agenda, about my own schedule, about my time. I need me time. I need my stuff. And there's this whole other person that has brought into my life that we need to live together and stride and step with one another. And what fatherhood showed me was how painful it can be when your kids disobey. And you think about what God sees with us. Right? All you want for your kids, who you love and for your care for, is just to listen. And the one, one, of, the, one of the only things that God asked for and expected from us from the beginning was obedience. Do not eat of this tree. Disobedience, sin rampages God's creation, relationship with God is broken, humanity tries and fails to make it right, and thankfully in steps Jesus. There's a beautiful parallel and connection between what it means to be a parent and what it means to be obedient to God our Father. Because like I said, parenting can be one of the most thankful, thankless tasks and thankless jobs, but it can also be one of the most rewarding and one of the most beautiful and one of the greatest blessings you can have. When we step aside and we put away our own selfishness and our own desires, we're able to do great things. Right? We can make Christ known by becoming unknown and stepping back. And so what are the th three things that Joseph teaches us? How to become righteous, how to become selfless, how to become obedient. So the question I want to ask you is, what are some of the ways that you can make Christ known this Christmas, right, this year? Is it forgiving somebody who hurt you? 
Right? Is it seeking forgiveness from somebody else? Is it choosing to fade into the background of a family gathering instead of being front and center? And maybe it looks like not engaging in that heated debate with an extended family, family member. Or it might, it might just look like selling, telling somebody the simple truth of the meaning behind Christmas, about the Savior who changed it all. Something I, sh- I share with my students is that you might be the closest thing somebody gets to Jesus. You might be the closest thing somebody gets to Jesus. The way you act, the way you speak, the truth that you share about the Bible, about what you believe, because if you truly believe that, then people will be able to pick up on that. So how can you make Christ known and then step back and allow God to do his work? Because becoming unknown doesn't mean we get to be a wallflower and let life pass us by and let people pass us by without hearing the gospel. We're all called to proclaim the good news of the birth of Jesus Christ and what he came to do. God with us is what he's called. And people have the right to hear that. So we make Christ known by becoming unknown. The focus is not on us. It is on Jesus. So it's my hope. I, I want others to see a passion and to see an excitement and most importantly to see my life as living proof of my salvation in Jesus Christ. So they'll they'll have that same passion, that same excitement, and most importantly, that same salvation in Jesus Christ. And all I have to do is be be willing to be selfless, be willing to be obedient, to be righteous, and to have hard conversations about the real gospel truth. Because real gospel truth in America today results in what? Awkward conversations, maybe some slight ostracization, heated disagreements, Maybe somebody will insult you. We become, we should be completely satisfied in, in, in knowing God and in him knowing us, that he knows us and he calls us by name. That should be the only thing that matters. So we make Christ known by setting aside our own comfort, our own expectations, our own desires, and by pointing people to Jesus and then stepping back and becoming unknown. Because it's not about us. It's about Jesus.